When you uh, get to the end of your life and the people closest to you sit down to write your obituary, what do you hope they say? Um, Now, for years, really decades, most obituaries followed a pretty standard formula. There'd be a picture, then below that picture, there'd be your name, the date you were born, the date you passed on, maybe a list of your relatives, and maybe one or two interesting things about you, and that was pretty much it. But in recent years, there's been a couple of of new trends that have emerged. One trend is a lot of people are now writing their own obituary before they pass away. I saw a couple of examples of this this week. I I read this one, a guy named Phil Thorpe, back in uh, 2018, starts these words, he said, I told you this would happen. (laughs) Then he continues, Philip Dayton Thorpe died from causes related to lifelong obesity and sleeping standing up. His grave marker will read, this corpse is Phil Thorpe's. Claude, as he was called even by those who knew his name, lived such a boring life that watching paint dry caused him to hyperventilate. His accomplishments will be published at a later date if any are discovered. Uh, Here's another one written by a lady named Betty Passmore from Tampa, Florida. She wrote, Betty Jo Passmore, 79, beloved wife and mother extraordinaire, ended her battle with cancer on September 29th, 2014. She resided in Tampa Bay for 63 years where she fostered a lifelong interest in mystery novels and dark chocolate. She is survived by George, her husband of 61 years, who prefers westerns and butter pecan. And then she goes through, she lists all their kids, all their grandkids, and in parentheses next to each of their names is their favorite snack, which I thought was cool. But then right at the end of her obituary, she includes this line, which I thought was interesting. A memorial service will be held October 4th at 2 p.m. at the First Church of God of Tampa Bay, which she has attended for 60 years in spite of the inclusion of contemporary music, which I thought was was interesting. Uh, Unfortunately, there's another recent trend that's not quite so funny. And it's some people are now using obituaries to settle the score with the person that is passed on. If you look online, you can find examples of this. One family ended the obituary of their 80-year-old mother with these words. She passed away on May 31st, 2018, in Springfield, Missouri, and will now face judgment. She will not be missed by her children who understand that the world is a better place without her. How about this one? After giving a summary of their father's life, a family closed his obituary with these words, Leslie's life served no obvious purpose. He did not contribute to society or serve his community, and he possessed no redeeming qualities. Besides quick-witted sarcasm, which was amusing during his sober days. With Leslie's passing, he'll be missed only for what he never did, being a loving husband, father, and good friend. His passing proves that evil does in fact die and hopefully marks a time of healing and safety for all. Now, when you get to the end of your life and the people closest to you sit down with a, a blank piece of paper, and they begin the process of crafting your obituary, what is it that you hope they say? Will it be a lighthearted, you know, reflection of a life well lived, or will it be something a little more painful, something that talks about broken relationships and missed opportunities? It's really a sobering question when you think about it, but the good news is that you'll play the the biggest role in how that question gets answered. So if you have your Bible or your phone, I want you to turn to to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Today we're, we're concluding our series, Family Fix-Up. If you missed any of these uh, messages, they're all on the website. You can download the FCC app. But today we want to focus on what it will take for, for all of us and for our families to experience a, a happy ending. Now there are certain things you can do. We all know that, that not every story has a happy ending, but there are certain things you can do that can help increase your family's odds of experiencing a, a happy ending. What you find in John 13 is part of what's called uh, Jesus' final discourse. What we're going to read takes place on Thursday night. The next morning will mark the beginning of Good Friday, 
which is the day that Jesus was crucified on the cross. But before all of that happens, Jesus and his disciples, these 12 guys who have been sort of his adopted family for these last three years, are going to separate themselves from the crowd. They're going to go to a place that we call the, the upper room, and they're going to have one final family meeting, one final opportunity for Jesus to, to tell them some things before things heat up and, and take off. The problem, though, is that as they're on their way to this meeting, there is an old argument that erupts among them. If you were here last week and we talked about it, it's an argument that seems to come up over and over again. It's mentioned three specific times in the Gospels, but the implication is this is something that they argued about all the time. Every time you think it's over, it comes back around. Luke, in Luke 22, summarizes what they were arguing about. Here's what he says. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. And these guys could not get out of their own way. Here's Jesus. He's heading towards what he knows will be his death. He's doing everything he can to prepare them, and they're worried about how they're going to advance their own careers. They are so self-focused and self-centered that they can't think of anything else except how Jesus' death is going to, it's going to affect them. So they finally arrive at the upper room, and they have this family meeting. I want you to look at what happens. John 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, the Passover festival, if you're familiar with the story of Exodus, the Israelite people are trying to escape Egyptian slavery. God's trying to get Pharaoh's attention, so he says he's going to kill every firstborn son, every firstborn animal in, the, in Egypt. And the only way you can escape that, you take the blood of a lamb, you paint it over the doorpost of your house, then the death angel comes through, and if you've got the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of your house, the death angel passes over your house. So every year, all of Israel would gather together, and they would celebrate and remember what God had done for them in the past. That's why the symbolism of John 13 is so rich. Jesus is not only reminding them of what God has done in the past, he's trying to prepare them for what God is about to do in the very near future. But there's something else here that's really important. And it kind of puts this, this whole story in perspective. Jesus knows at this point that his time is short. See, one of the things that, that Jesus did that a lot of us don't do is that he lived with the end in mind. He knew from the very moment he got here to this earth that his life was, was moving toward a very definite conclusion. He knew that his time was going to be short. And so as he's moving toward that end, he's doing everything he can to prepare himself and to prepare the people closest to him for that end. Now, most of the time, most of us, we like to approach life as if we're going to live forever, right? We don't like to think about, hey, there might be an end. And so since we don't like to think about it, anytime we're confronted with that reality, we push it out of our minds as quickly as possible because we just, we don't want to deal with it. And so what happens is instead of preparing for the end, we sort of wind up drifting toward the end. And we just sort of hope that, hey, everything, hopefully everything will turn out okay. And we don't really prepare ourselves. We don't prepare the people closest to us. We just like to live with this illusion that, hey, everything's automatically going to be okay. But if you know that every story eventually has a last chapter, then it only makes sense that rather than, than drifting toward the finish line, that you would do the hard work of preparing yourself and the people closest to you for the inevitable end and help prepare them for a happy ending. And that's what Jesus is, is doing in this passage. He knows the time has come for him to leave this world and to return to his Father in heaven. And so rather than drifting toward the finish line, he takes one final opportunity on this final night of his earthly life in this private family meeting to prepare his friends and, and the men who have become his family for a happy ending. Three things that you see Jesus do that, that we need to do. And here's the first one if you're keeping track. As you, as you live with the end in mind, make sure that you express unconditional love. Why don't you check out what happens in verse 2. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had all things under his power, and then he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. 
After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around. Now, if you grew up in church, you've heard this story numerous times. In fact, you've heard it so much that the drama of the moment just sort of passes most of us by. But in this instance, the tension is so thick, you could cut it with a knife. And the reason it's so thick is because behind the scenes, one of the men who has been a part of Jesus' inner circle, one of these 12, a guy named Judas Iscariot has already cut a deal with the religious leaders for the small sum of 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. That's why today, when it's automatic, whenever you hear his name, you think of him as a traitor. In fact, that's one of the words we use when we talk about somebody that's betrayed us. We call them a Judas. But if you go back to the beginning of the story, it wasn't always like that. At the very beginning, Judas was just like the other guys. I mean, he left everything to, to follow Jesus. He walked the same roads they walked. He listened to the same messages they listened to. He went to the same Bible studies, witnessed the same miracles, volunteered in the same ministries. I mean, went to the same worship services. I mean, there was no distinction. It wasn't like you had these 11 guys over here and here's Judas. They were all part of one group. They were seen as being part of, of one family. And at the beginning... Judas was right there with the other guys. For three years, for the three years he was with Jesus, he was recognized as a part of that group. I mean, if you saw him walking down the street, you'd think, there goes Judas, he's close to Jesus, and he was. But what wound up happening is over time, Judas became increasingly disillusioned and increasingly disconnected from Jesus and the other guys in the group. Didn't happen overnight, but eventually the other guys started to notice that, that Judas wasn't quite as engaged as he once had been. He's a little more distant in his relationships than he had been. At the same time, his attitude toward Jesus started to get a little more critical. In fact, John chapter 12, David mentioned this Wednesday night, this, the chapter right before this one, Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. He stops off to see his friends, uh, Lazarus, who has two sisters, Mary and Martha. And while they're there, Mary takes out this really expensive bottle of perfume and she pours it on Jesus' head as an act of worship. She's anointing him and sort of symbolizing what's to come. And everybody's watching this and John inserts this footnote that tells us that the perfume she used was worth you know, a whole year's wages for the average person. So you're talking about you know, $25,000, $40,000 worth of perfume. And everybody's sort of just taken in awe of this moment. They can't believe what's happening. Everybody except for Judas. And he's watching what's happening. He starts to criticize her. And he says, you know, that, that could have been sold. We could have used that money to, to help the poor. And then John inserts a footnote that says Judas' main priority was not helping the poor. He was stealing the money because he was the treasure for the family. You ever had somebody in your family steal from you? You ever had somebody get in your purse or in your wallet when you weren't paying attention? Take your cash. You ever had somebody find an old checkbook and just start writing checks in your name? Or get your credit card number and you get the statement at the end of the month, all of a sudden there's hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, maybe tens of thousands of dollars, and you didn't know anything about it? That's what Judas was doing. He was stealing from the guys who were basically his, his family because of his own selfishness. But then his, his selfishness eventually turned to, to outright hostility. And so at some point, Jesus, uh, Judas cuts this deal to betray Jesus to the religious leaders. And we don't really know what prompted it, but here's the point. Jesus already knew about it. When they walked in the upper room that night to celebrate this last time together, have this private family meeting, Jesus already knew what had happened. None of this was going to take him by surprise. That's what makes this so powerful. Jesus had every reason in the world to come down on Judas. I mean, you put yourself in, in his shoes, what would you have done? Here's this guy that's betrayed you, he's stolen from you, he's criticized you, he's been dishonest with you. I mean, what would you do if you were Jesus? If you're like me, you'd be tempted to just sort of lower the boom on Judas. That's not what Jesus does. Instead, Jesus gets down on his hands and his knees and he washes the dirty, nasty, smelly feet of his disciples, including Judas. Now, if you know the story, you know these guys, they walked everywhere they went. Uh, they wore sandals. The roads were, 
were dirt or mud. So wherever they would go somewhere, there'd normally be a servant who was assigned to wash the feet of whoever came in. But in this instance, there's no servant there. And nobody wants that job because if that's your job, then that means you're the low man on the pole, right? Nobody wants that job. And here's these guys. They've just, I mean, they've just finished arguing about who, which of them is going to be the greatest. And so they get in this room and nobody's there to wash their feet and nobody's going to volunteer to do it except for Jesus. And he takes on the role of a servant and he does for these guys what nobody would do for him. That's a good reminder. You're never too important and you're never too big to serve. And you're never at a point where there are certain jobs that are beneath you. But what really stands out to me about this part of the story is that even though he clearly didn't deserve it, Jesus included Judas in all of this. It's not like he skipped him over to pay attention to the other guys. I mean, after all that Judas had done, rather than kicking him out of the group, rather than excluding him, Jesus takes one last opportunity to express his unconditional love to a member of his adopted family who's turned against him. A couple weeks ago, I told you about this book. I want to show you a picture of it. It's a really incredible book. It's titled 30 Lessons for Living, Tried and True Advice from the Wisest Americans, written by uh, Carl Pillmeyer, PhD from Cornell University. Uh, in, in preparation for this book, Dr. Pillmeyer spent nearly a decade interviewing in-depthly uh, 1,500 people ages 70 to 100. He said, look back over your life, tell me some of the things you learned, tell me some of the things you regret. And in one section of the book, they talk about regrets. Everybody has regrets. They're talking to these older people. Now that you're moving toward the finish line, what are the things that you regret most? And people gave him their list, and, and some of that was predictable. People said things like, I wish I'd worked less and traveled more. Wish I'd taken more risk. Wish I'd discovered my purpose earlier. Wish I'd taken better care of my health. I mean, you, you, we all know that. We can all identify with that. But you know what? The, the, the number one area that most people had the deepest regrets in? Relationships. And do you know what the number one thing they mentioned in that area of relationships was? Over and over again, the most common regret that these older people expressed was, quote, not resolving a family estrangement. Let me read you these words from Dr. Pilmar. Some of the unhappiest older people I met were those who had a rift with a child and no longer had contact with him or her. Almost all wished they had tried harder to reconcile, ask for forgiveness, apologized, or tried to communicate before it became too late. Then listen to this part. The kinds of things that seemed worth saying, my way or the highway, when you were 40 and they were 18, usually never seem worth it at 80. And even if their relationships with their other children were great, the one with whom there was this irreparable rift still caused them a lot of remorse and anguish. Some of you can relate to that. Some of you have kids that you don't speak to. And some of you have parents that you never call. Maybe it's a brother, sister, maybe it's somebody else, but according to their experts, around 25% of people live with some sort of family estrangement. Dr. Pilmeyer followed that up with a later study, and here's what he discovered. He talked to hundreds of people who had taken the, the time to work through some of those issues and achieve reconciliation in those relationships. Here's what he discovered. When they got to the, the last stage of their life and they were asked to point out their greatest accomplishments, all of them said the reconciliation with the person they were estranged from was their greatest accomplishment of their life, no matter what else they'd accomplished. Now, here's the deal. For that kind of reconciliation to happen, somebody has to take the first step. Somebody has to make the first phone call. Somebody has to say, hey, I, I know we messed this up, but I just want you to know I love you and I care about you, and they may not deserve it, and they may have hurt you, but you'll feel better if you'll make that call. Here's the second thing. As you prepare for a, a happy ending, make sure you do your best to, to display unlimited patience. Let's check out what happens next in verse 6. The, the focus shifts here from Judas to Peter. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. 
No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. One of the things I like about Peter, maybe you can relate to this, is just like me, uh, he messes it up. I mean, he gets it wrong just as much as he gets it right. Maybe he gets it wrong more than he gets it right. And the, the picture you get of Peter, here's this guy that's short-tempered. Uh, he sometimes uh, speaks before he thinks. He sometimes makes rash decisions. And, and more often than not, he misunderstands what Jesus is trying to tell him. In fact, in, in this instance, he actually argues with Jesus. He sees that Jesus is about to, to wash his feet, and he stops him. He says, no, you're not going to do that. And in fact, in Greek, it's even more emphatic than it is in English. He says, never in all eternity are you going to wash my feet. And then Jesus explains what he's doing. All of a sudden, he goes to the opposite extreme. He says, well, if that's the case, don't just wash my feet. Then you just, you just give me a bath. And that's kind of how Peter was, kind of one extreme to the other. Sometimes he was up. Sometimes he was down. He'd say one thing, and the next minute, he'd say the opposite. But here's what I want you to know. So you go back and you read through Peter's life. All these different instances where he, he messes it up, he says the wrong thing, and all of that, and Jesus never seems to grow impatient with him. At no point does Jesus ever allow his frustration with Peter to overshadow his love for Peter. Now, don't misunderstand. He doesn't just overlook his missteps, but he never condemns him. He offers, he offers uh, correction without condemnation. He doesn't berate him, doesn't throw things, he doesn't storm off, he, he doesn't do any of the stuff that, that we sometimes, let me tell you something else he never does. You read through the, the whole Gospels, you, you'll never see Jesus do this. He never looks at Peter and says, Peter, why can't you be more like your brother Andrew? I mean, Andrew's with him. He, he never messes up. He never says the wrong thing. He never steps out. Why can't you, why can't you be more like him? Jesus never does that. The other thing he doesn't do that, that we sometimes do is whenever Peter messes up, he doesn't go back and remind him of all the times he's messed up before. He doesn't say, hey, remember last time he went through this and the time before that and the time before that? And what, he doesn't do any of that. That's, that's what we do. We like to compare and remind. Jesus doesn't do that. He encourages and corrects. Instead of focusing on the past, he focuses on the future. Now, now here's the question. What about you? <laughs> How do you handle it when the people closest to you disappoint you? What do you do? Do you come down, you know, do you come down hard on them and hope they, they learn their lesson? Do you go back and rehearse every time they've messed up in the past so that you can kind of hold it over them? Or do you shift the focus from the past to the future? And here's why this is so important. Matthew 7, Jesus said it like this. For in the same way that you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure that you use, that's what's going to be measured to you. So if you want God to be patient with you, which all of us do, that means we have to be patient with each other. Now, one more thing. This is really important. If you want to set your family up for long-term success, it's going to require consistent Modeling. Check out what Jesus says in verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you in an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now check out verse 17. This is the one you better underline. He says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So Jesus says, hey, I'm the example. You're supposed to, to follow my example. But then he follows it up with that statement. Now, if you, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. And what I want you to notice there, it's not enough just to know what to do. 
All of us know what to do. If I gave you a blank piece of paper, said, hey, write down 10 or 12 ways that you can improve your relationships with the people closest to you. Everybody can make their own list, and they'd probably be pretty good. But that's never the issue. Everybody knows what to do. The struggle is actually doing it. If you look again at verse 17, one of the ways that the word blessed can be translated is as the word happy. So you could read this as saying, now that you know these things, you will be happy if you do them. Now, deep down inside, all of us want to experience a happy ending. We want our families to experience a a happy ending. And when the people closest to you sit down and they begin to, to write your obituary, you hope that it can be a, an, on, an honest reflection of a, of a happy life, but you also know that it's not automatic that it will be. To get there, there are certain things that you have to do, not just know. I've got a picture I want to show you. The guy you see on the screen is John Piper. He's been a famous preacher and a theologian out in Minneapolis for a long time. He started a ministry called Desiring God. His, his sermons have been downloaded just millions of times, written over 30 books, many of whom became bestsellers. This guy's books have literally sold millions of copies. He's a, to say he's a rock star to a certain segment of the church would be an understatement. He, he's sort of the, the, the head guru of a whole wing of the, the church. Back in 2012, he retired uh, from leading Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis. He's been there for 32 years, and since then, he has poured himself into uh, writing and traveling and speaking at conferences. He's been married to his wife, Noelle, since 1968, and together they have four sons and one adopted daughter. But just like any family and just like your family, it has not always been smooth sailing. There have been some messy divorces, painful separations, pretty intense arguments, and and even periods of disagreement. One point, a few years ago, before he retired, he looked around, his family was in such disarray that he took a whole year off from his church and just spent that whole year trying to fix things with his family. And thankfully, during that time, for the most part, they were able to to work through some of their issues. And today, uh, four of his five kids either work in different churches and ministry or are involved in their dad's organization, so it's all turned out uh, pretty much okay. There's one son, however that's chosen to go a different direction. I have another picture I want to show you. This is uh, Dr. Piper, and next to him is his son, Abraham Piper. And and over the last uh, 15 or 16 months, about the time that the COVID stuff uh, started, his son has become what they call a social media influencer. That's something that, that didn't exist a few years ago. But now he's got over a million followers on the social media app, uh, TikTok. If you don't know what that is, Um, ask your kids or your grandkids Uh, and what he does on TikTok is he posts these videos and it's just like his dad he preaches these little mini sermons only the problem is that what he is saying is is the complete opposite of what his dad says so let me just let me just read you some of the titles from the videos recent videos Uh, why nobody really believes in hell what to replace Christianity with what you should do if you still have evangelical parents, or this one is his most famous one. This is the one that went viral. It was titled, uh, Why Christianity is a Destructive, Narrow-Minded Worldview. Now, because of who his dad is, and because he's now surpassed his dad in the number of followers on social media, the New York Times caught on to this. They did an article just a few weeks ago about Abraham Piper. And what they did, they go through and they pull out little quotes from the videos that he's posting. And then they find these quotes from his dad's his books and, you know, sermons and all that. And they just, they compare them. So here's what he said. Here's what his dad said. And, I mean, it's just the total opposite of, of everything you can imagine. Completely opposite ends of the spectrum. What some people have noticed, though, is in all the hundreds of videos that Abraham Piper has posted, He never directly criticizes his dad, never mentions his dad. Now, he criticizes everything his dad's ever said, but he never mentions his dad by name. At the same time, people have been paying attention to this. You know, Dr. Piper's been writing, been traveling the world, been posting his own videos. He gets asked about this every Q&A. Reporters call him all the time. What do you think about what your son said? And he never responds. No comment. 
when it comes to his relationship with his son, but he never criticizes him. And that's led people that, that know both of these men <clears throat> to admit that while the relationship is obviously strained, they're, they're, they're trying to be careful in what they say. They're trying to keep the lines of communication open <clears throat> so that maybe one day in the future there can be reconciliation. <clears throat> now, with that in mind, I want you to listen to something that Piper wrote back in 2017. This was just as Abraham was starting to go a different direction. And somebody wrote into Dr. Piper's website and asked this question about their own kids. And on his website, there's this feature. You just submit a question. And sometimes he answers it. And here was their question. How did I fail my unbelieving children? I want you to listen to what Piper wrote. He said, this is so important, so important. Here's what he said. We all sinned. We all did less than we could. None of us prayed as much as we could. None of us fasted as much as we could, if we even fasted at all. None of us humbled ourselves as much as we could. None of us was as consistent in our life as we could have been. None of us was as faithful to the word of God as we could have been. None of us in exhortation, kindness, meekness, or gentleness was as good as we could have been. It is hopeless to base our present peace and joy on the assurance that we did a good job as parents. That is building on a house of sand. And if you know the backstory. And you read that, you can hear the, the regret. Some of you can relate to that. Some of you have kids who are not following Jesus, and there's a part of you that wonders if maybe it's not partially your fault. Maybe you didn't model it like you should have. Maybe you let other things take priority. And now it feels like there's this heavy weight that's hanging over you. And what tends to happen is as you get a little bit closer to the finish line, that weight gets a little bit heavier. And you wonder, what can I do? I want to read you one more quote. This is from Eugene Peterson. Here's what he wrote. A search of Scripture turns up one rather surprising truth. There are no exemplary families. Not a single family is portrayed in the Bible in such a way as to evoke admiration in us. The biblical material consistently portrays the family not as a Norman Rockwell group beaming with gratitude around a, a Thanksgiving turkey, but as a series of broken relationships in need of redemption. Everybody's in the same boat. And the things that we struggle with are the same things that the people in the Bible struggle with. But here's the good news. If, you, if you're in a situation in which there's some repair work that needs to be done, with your relationships with the people closest to you, it's not too late. As long as you're breathing, it's not too late. But in order for that to happen, somebody has to make the first step. I want you to stand with me. It could be that some of you are thinking right now about the phone call you need to make, the letter that you need to write. Others of you, maybe like Peter, you're thinking about how the, the relationship that needs the most repair is the one you have with God. Maybe you've messed it up. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's disappointment. Maybe you spent too much time, you know, looking at other people, not enough time looking at Jesus. And if that's the case, I want you to know it's, it's not too late. I mean, if you're here, he's here. He stands ready to do what you want him to do. So if you'll somehow find the courage to take a step toward him, that may be the step you need to take that, that has the ripple effects that affects not only your spiritual life, but every part of your life. I mean, you can make a decision today that would affect not only you, but your kids and your grandkids, and maybe even your, your great-grandkids. But here's the deal. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them.